This is an interview with Jim Hull, February 20th, 2008. We're in the uh, Studio X of WILL in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Nancy Rotzel, and the videographer is Henry Radcliffe. Okay, tell me where you were when World War II started. Pearl Harbor, how did you hear about it? Well, I was in Galleon, Ohio, and uh, was very distracting. Uh, couldn't believe that anybody had that much power and uh, the guts to attack the United States. But uh, they did. And of course, that was the beginning of World War II. How old were you? I was 21. And what were you doing? Uh, I was working at an industrial plant, uh, making uh, dump bodies for got galleon on them. You see them all over the world. And uh, I did assembly line work, uh, different things. And uh, I was drafted. I didn't volunteer. And September 1942, I was inducted into the the service at Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, they gave me a two weeks leave, and I went back to Galleon to straighten up my affairs. Then I had to report back to Cleveland, and all the people that was inducted at that time in September uh, returned, and they put us on a train, and we went to El Paso, Texas. Uh, at El, El Paso, Texas, where we got our basic training and our 25-mile hikes, uh, and we became the Coast Guard artillery. After uh, two weeks at Fort Bliss, Texas, I was made a PFC, private first class, and I trained a lot of men down there because they didn't know their left hand from their right hand. I had to put stones in their left hand and sticks or whatever I could find, and uh, I did a lot of drilling, you know, left flank, right flank, rear march, and all those good commands. Uh, and we done a great job. And at 12 weeks, they made me a corporal. Well, by that time, uh, we was ready to move from Fort Bliss, Texas, to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And at Fort Knox, Kentucky, we became a uh, 453rd Automatic Weapons Battalion. And there we accumulated our two and a half ton trucks to pull 40 millimeter guns. And uh, uh, we accumulated, and I was in B battery. The, a, the uh, battalion was consisted of a headquarters, A, B, C, and D batteries. And uh, I was in B battery. Uh, uh, we picked up a half track that had four 50 caliber machine guns on it. Uh, picked up our small rifles, carbines, small pistols, and one thing or another. And uh, I forget how long we were at uh, Fort Knox. Uh, and then they moved us from there to North uh, to uh, Camp Stewart, Georgia. And uh, we was in the swamps down there, and uh, we slept in pup tents where the snakes liked to crawl in under our bedrolls and stay with us at night. And uh, the alligators and the wild hogs and all that good stuff down there. And uh, we did, of course, more training, more training. And then from there, we went on Tennessee maneuvers. Well, at that time, they made me acting sergeant over a gun crew, and uh, that's 15 men. Oh, I, I forgot to say, in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, we picked up a, a electronic equipment to guide the gun uh, with an 800-pound uh, generator. And, uh, of course, it had to generate the electricity from the director to the gun. And, of course, we trained with that all, all through uh, Tennessee maneuvers. Uh, one of the little incidents that I remember in uh, the Tennessee maneuvers was you know, we had to dig a hole 
to set the, the 40 millimeter gun in. I had a little, little guy by the name of Larry Carmen in uh, Grand Pass, Oregon. He said, I ain't digging a hole. Well, he and I had a little talk and he dug a hole. <laughs> and uh, from there, uh, they moved us to uh, North Carolina uh, where we fired out over the Atlantic. And I, uh, on my gun crew, I had taught the guys, you know, you got to lead your plane quite a bit. And uh, the vertical had to be on line, of course. And one day we were fired down there and the, the guy on the, elect, uh, on the asthma side of the director, he turned around to the lieutenant and he says, uh, the next shot I'll cut the cord on that uh, uh, target. And then the next shot cut that target off of that plane. So uh, we of course got a great name from that episode. And uh, when they moved us from there, up to Fort Dix, New Jersey to go to England, we pulled the gunnery on the ship. And I being a artillery mechanic, I was allowed on deck on that ship. And I spent a lot of times out there on the deck. And at times I could see the rudders on the back end of the boat that it rocked up so high. So, uh, uh, we, we got into a, a real bad storm, and the boat tipped way over. If it had tipped another two degrees, we would have sunk. But anyway, we arrived in uh, Liverpool, England. How, how long was that after you had been inducted? Uh, that was 1940, February 1944. Okay. And uh, we had... Uh, uh, in England, they moved us down to a place that called Black Shamor. It was uh, outfitted with quartz huts, you know, the round buildings. And uh, uh, we practiced some uh, gunnery there. And uh, the uh, invasion was June the 6th. And they had moved us from there down to Yeovil near Southampton in England. Uh, we had to waterproof our guns and everything, get ready for D-Day. And uh, uh, we did go in on D-Day because we were artillery. The infantry had to go in ahead of us and get some uh, land so we could move in there. And uh, uh, just before we left England, I have a letter here from uh, uh, President Eisenhower, and it is to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Al Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the greatest crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers-in-arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of the Nazi tyranny over the oppressed people of the Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. This is the year, 1944. Much has happened uh, since the Nazi triumph of 1941. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. 
I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And now, when I, I read this, how about cry? Did every man I, receive that? At, at that time, I didn't think, you know, we, we were just gung-ho to go get Hitler. And uh, but now when I read that, that means a lot. I understand that. Did every man receive a copy every, of that letter? Every man got a copy of that. What yeah. was the reaction? Uh, what? What was the reaction? Well, among the we men? didn't think anything about it, or I didn't at the time. You know, uh, I was just so built up with uh, uh, all the training I had been through, and I had one goal, and that was to get Hitler. So, uh, uh, but now uh, it means something. When you went, when you went in, you said the infantry went in ahead of you. Yeah, the infantry went in ahead of us. So you knew what had happened to the infantry when they hit the beaches? Yeah, we lost 6,000 men there. Now those boats uh, in the English, or in that English Channel there, uh, they had b balloons like a football uh, that were up above the ships, oh, three or 400 feet, uh, to keep the German planes from uh, getting right down on us to strafe us. So, you know, we got strafed and shelled there because they was way up on a mountain and uh, they were in concrete bunkers and uh, they had uh, dropped a lot of bombs on them. But, of course, they were still able to, to shoot at us down there on the ships. And uh, I was fortunate enough to... Uh, get off of the ship and get into a boat and they took me to shore and uh, that's I went in at the o Omaha Beach. There was two beaches for the United States. One of them was Omaha and the other uh, Idaho or uh, <laughs> Utah. And, uh, anyway, it was two beaches. I went at Utah. Omaha. And uh, uh, and you heard about the hedgerows. Uh, the hedgerows was uh, a lot of deep-rooted trees and concrete bunkers built in them. And uh, uh, one day they took our 80 mil, our 40 millimeter guns up there, and uh, we shot direct fire on them. Our gun uh, carried a missile was about 17 inches long, with a three-quarter pound shell in the end of it. Uh, would would take down a plane easily, uh, but we fired direct fire into those bunkers, and uh, after we captured some of them Germans, they wanted to know what kind of a gun we had. And after the breakthrough there at uh, St. Lo, uh, I, we were attached to the 83rd Infantry Division, and we guarded the 105 Howitzer outfit. Uh, we went out and liber liberated uh, a big seaport at the end of the Normandy Peninsula named Cherbourg. And uh, oh my, the, the men and the equipment that poured through that seaport, uh, we had men and guns, everything all around us. It was a tremendous group. And uh, uh, we were in the 1st Army, the 3rd Army, the 9th Army, the 15th Army. We went where all the battles were. And uh, we was in the 1st Army there. And of course, everybody's heard about Patton, uh, Blood and Guts. And we were attached to him. Uh, and Lower River, which is about the middle of France, uh, the men, uh, the uh, Germans had been driven out of Africa back through Italy and southern France. Well, a bunch of them Germans came up there on the Loire River, and 20,000 of them surrendered there. And from there, uh, we went with Pat to the Rhine River, and he wanted to keep on going, but they wouldn't let him. So I don't know what was on the other side. 
Anyway, uh, we left them and uh, we went north and our next battle was the Argon Force. Uh, it's also known as the Hercut Force. And the mud was knee deep. Uh, we had to cut down pine trees to, to make us a road to run those uh, two and a half ton trucks over to uh, pull our equipment. Uh, from uh, after that, by uh, uh, they pulled us on north, and uh, uh, we had a rest period in there. And it wasn't long till they moved us on north again, and where we had been, they moved a green unit in there. Well, the Germans had somehow built up a real tremendous force back of us or east of us. And uh, uh, when the Battle of Bulge started, they run right over that green unit and was headed for the English Channel. Well, they took us, the 83rd Infantry Division, around and we hit them in the nose and stopped them. Uh, and then in the Battle of the Bulge, it was seven above zero. Man, it was cold. And one day, uh, I had fixed my bayonet. I saw a German sitting behind a tree with his rifle, uh, you know, just squatted down and ready to shoot. And I walked around the tree. He wasn't moving. Uh, he was froze stiff, and I just kicked him over. Uh, it was Oh, it was cold. Another thing that happened there uh, was one of the buddies got killed, and uh, uh, I was cold, and I took his blanket. So I, that carried with me. Well, from there, uh, we went on east, driving the Germans clear back into Germany. And uh, uh, at the Elbe River, the 83rd Division was the only division that held a bridge over the Elbe River, and we named it Truman Bridge. And it got a picture, picture of it here, uh, the sign that he put on it. Well, after that, uh, then. Uh, we went into the Army of Occupation where uh, uh, we just went into the German houses and tried to confiscate their guns and equipment. And some of them didn't understand. Who, they wanted us to open the door. And I kicked in a lot of beautiful doors uh, to get their equipment. And if one of them, I I picked up a swastika flag that I have with me. And uh, uh, it's pretty unique because I, I took that flag and sent it to my mother and dad who lived in California. And mom washed it and put it out on the line. And she had more, more airplanes diving at it than she knew what to do with it. So she wasn't long getting the flag down. <laughs> Uh, well, after the uh, our, the uh, occupation, uh, they took us down into southern France, and they had these great big tents where they was consolidating all of us. To, uh, you had to have so many units to go back to the United States. And uh, I found out that I was down the line a little ways, and uh, I asked them uh, if I could uh, go back to the area in uh, England, Handley, where we were at, in Black Shimor. And uh, one night I was in line to get some fish and chips, and there was two girls ahead of me. And one ahead of the girl in front of me turned around and looked at me, and she looked, <laughs> I looked at her, and uh, uh, we went, got her fish and chips, and uh, disappeared. So I went to a pub and she got with her girlfriend and they looked me up and uh, uh, we started going together. Uh, 
I went to Sears or, and started correspondence. And uh, her name was Doris Bladen. And she tried to get me to go to England. And I said, no, you want to come to the United States, I'll marry you. And uh, she came to the United States. And then we had, uh, that was January the 1st, 1947. And uh, her brother took me to New York to meet her. She came over on the Queen Elizabeth. And we was married January the 11th uh, in uh, Mansfield, Ohio, by the minister by the name of Dr. Sheriff. <laughs> and uh, then we had uh, uh, four children, Julie and Glenda, and Brian and Danny. And uh, now I've got uh, uh, nine grandkids, 17 great-grandkids, and two great-great-grandkids. So uh, that's about, uh, oh, no, I went back to England, I went, or went back to uh, uh, France, where I was shipped home. And uh, I was discharged at Indiantown Gap, Pennsylvania, December the 15th, 1945. I know you brought something along to show you how, to show people how different the food was that you had when you were in the service as compared to what your wife was willing to cook when you got home. Do you, you want to show? I got, uh, I've got some uh, K ration here. This was our evening meal. It was uh, chopped pork and eggs. <laughs> uh, at times when you didn't have anything to eat, these come in pretty handy. How many of those could you carry at a time? How many days worth? Uh, well, they, they usually keep these at the headquarters, and uh, then they take them out uh, uh, to you when the when the time came to feed you. Uh, this was our breakfast uh, for our breakfast food. Uh, you put water with it. That was for lunch, and uh, that was for supper. And we had paper. You know what that was for? Coffee. And we had uh, uh, coffee. And above what else? A package of cigarettes. Well, it's been so long since I had them out here that they're stuck fast in there, but uh, well, that's all right. They're in there. That's all right. So, uh, so you, so when you were at the Battle of the Bulge, you were carrying a gun in addition to your yeah serving the big guns M1 and carrying gun and, and yeah. carrying packages of yeah. mm -hmm. food. Yeah. Have you talked to your grandkids about no all your experience no. No, this will be news for them. When you came back, did you talk about it? No. Why was that? I don't know. I just never did. Well, we're grateful you're talking about it now. Yeah. Yeah, now after uh, the war was over, uh, we received a letter from President Harry Truman. And... Uh, I'll read it here. To you who answered the call of your country and served in its armed forces to bring about the total defeat of the enemy, I extend the heartfelt thanks of a grateful nation as one of the nation's finest. You undertook the most severe task one can be called upon to perform because you dem demonstrated the fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary to carry out that task. We now look to you for leadership and the example in further 
exalting our country in peace. President Harry Truman. Looking back on it, what do you remember most? Well, uh, I think the most thing was being shot at and strafed. I was uh, in the middle of France one day and uh, uh, somebody was shooting at me and I could feel the, the air off of the bullet and hear it when it go by my left ear. And of course being strafed and shelled, uh, I'm very, very fortunate to be here. I know there were a lot of men that were lost who yeah. you probably miss. When you came back, I know you did something for the, the soldiers in Illinois, the recognition. Yeah, uh, took me six years to uh, uh, get the Purple Heart Memorial Highway on uh, Route 72 from uh, Champaign to Quincy, Illinois. Uh, I started out with uh, Representative Tim Johnson and Rick Winkle and uh, Tom Burns and Neilma Jacobson, several of the representatives in that six years. And uh, I finally uh, succeeded in getting a Purple Heart uh, Memorial Highway for all the, the men to have Purple Hearts in the state of Illinois. How many medals did you win? I have seven medals. Uh, I have one for uh, uh, Normandy, Brittany, uh, the Ardennes Force, the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, Northern Germany, where we went back to uh, push the Germans back into Germany and the occupation. And uh, I have another one uh, from the people of Normandy for uh, the guys that liberated Normandy. And I have another one that uh, I was awarded a certificate of merit uh, for outstanding performance of taking care of all the, uh, uh, all the guns and equipment, uh, keeping it up in working order and the uh, uh, Every time I would have a gun that might need repair, the captain said, there's my driver, there's my Jeep, and here's the map. <laughs> so uh, I would, very fortunate enough, now if you got off of the road uh, to get to your ordinance, you would get shot. And I tried to pick out a lot of landmarks when I went by. So when I come back, I knew I was on the right road, and uh, I was very fortunate got to the ordinance, got back with all the equipment. Did you celebrate when the war was declared that it was over? Oh, I might have done a few jumps. And <laughs> yeah, was pretty happy. How'd your family feel when you got home? Oh, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Did you call them to tell them you were coming? Uh, yeah, we wrote letters back and forth. Uh, my mom wrote me all the time. No phone calls? No. Did you, do you feel satisfied at the end of it? Oh yes, very much so. Yeah, it was a great accomplishment. Is there anything you'd like to say to, to people who are seeing this about your experience? Well, I, I think I'm very grateful to WILL or having me in for the interview and uh, telling people of my experience. And, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I understand it's for educational purposes too, that uh, maybe uh, a lot of people can uh, relate to what I went through. Thank you.